Hi again, welcome to this episode of Auction Watch, the show where we deep dive into some lots that are coming up for sale at auction. I'm joined today, as usual, by our special auction supremos, Piot Rizanik, Rod Turner, and Jay Howard. I'm your host, Ranjan Bhattacharya. If you're new to this channel, make sure you subscribe and hit the bell icon, because if you don't, you'll miss out on some fabulous content that we put out each and every week to keep property investors on top of their game. So what have we got in this episode? Well, we've got a former cop shop down in Worcester Park. You'll see what that's all about. And we've also got a mixed use shop and uppers uh, piece of action, a bit of a parade uh, in South East London, Eltham. That's what we've got going on. So stay tuned for more. <laughs> So we're off to the SDL auction, lot eight, for a cop shop. It was basically a former police station in a high street. It's shopping uppers, but it was actually used as a former police station. And obviously the angle here is to do some kind of residential conversion. Now, um, this is one where, which um, was guided at 320, but sold for an incredible £744,000. So this is slightly unusual to in what we do on Auction Watch because this property has just sold in the last couple of weeks mm -hmm. and we're going to have a look at possibly why it's, it's achieved the price it had. Because, I mean, Jay, um, is it usual for a property to sell at double the guide price? What's going on there? Yeah, I mean, if there is a clear and present avenue to drastically increase the value of the property, then someone is going to be buying it um, factoring in, hopefully factoring in costs and profit. Now, people do it in different ways. For us, we would have to factor in cost and profit on sale, but most people, uh, most, most people who would be doing a deal like this would be factoring it in on purchase price, cost, and then what they can revalue it for, how much money they can take out as reinvestable. Um, so on something like this, 744, is it 40 grand over odds? Is it 20 grand under? You don't know because I don't know what someone else's costs are going to be, but um, there is a scorpion tail in this t uh, in this tail, isn't there? Massive, massive. I'm I am not sure here because look, this is a straightforward permitted development um, because although it's a cop shop, it's a police station. It's not quite a police station. It was used as offices, so it falls under Class E. So permitted yeah. development would apply. Uh, to, the, to this space. So that's easy, you can convert it to flats. But this is being sold by the Metropolitan Police and this is the absolute essential thing about reading that legal pack because buried in the legal pack there was an overage which basically says that any profit you make uh, you have to pay 50% of the profit, your development profit, over to the Metropolitan Police. What do you think about overage agreements? Well, they're no longer they no longer call them overage agreements. These big kind of um, rip-off agreements. What do they call them? Well, they, they call them an, they call them anti-embarrassment clauses yeah. um, because they don't want they want don't want to, they don't want this to sell for four hundred thousand, then someone make a million and a half pounds off it because it, to their stakeholders and local government and central government, it'll look like something dodgy has been done there, right? Um, the problem, uh, it won't apply in this instance, but for anyone who's looking at um, overage clauses, clawback provisions is what they used to be called back in the day, or anti-embarrassment clauses, they're more commonly known nowadays, is actually if they're ambiguous or they, they're not time restricted or there isn't a, an adequate trigger point, they can be quite um, ineffectual at being... Um, Unfortunately for the buyer... The... In this instance, it's going to be drafted by the in-house police people. <laughs> the, the Metropolitan um, Police have been selling off, disposing of properties quite steadily over the last decade, and it's been very common. Yeah. It's, so I've, I've, got, I've got stuff at the moment which has similar clauses in, but there's a lifeline to them. Yeah. So there's a lifespan on them, sorry, um, whereby it might be um, if you develop it out before 2025 or sell it before 2025, then that will apply. So normally the anti-embarrassment is because they don't want to sell it to someone and then you go and sell it on straight away and make a massive profit. Yeah. Where that, That's kind of the, the whole kind of thing behind the anti-embarrassment. Whereas if you sell it, I don't know, 10 years later, that's something very, very different. So I'd be interested to see if there is any time span on that. Um, if not, 
it's again, it's it's going to be very very tricky to make any money if yeah. they are going down that permitted development route. I I think the um, the problem. The problem with it, it is five years, but it's a trigger point. And I think we'll find that the trigger point is the gaining of permission. Um, so go. the minute you apply for, because it's, it's unusable as it is. Yeah, so you'd be applying for PD, and then be, and then when you get your permitted development for the flats, they'll they'll be charging it on a notional improvement in value. Yeah, but I mean, it's not going to be worth more than seven hundred seventy-three. No, no, they've they've, for, for, they've paid so, it up so front. Exactly, they paid more than it up front. I mean, it, so yeah. So actually, one of the ways to get around, and this may maybe we we could have started this all off in the completely wrong vein, suggesting the person who bought this didn't know their arsehole from their elbow. There's an entire possibility that what they've done is they have paid the equivalent value of the increase in property value at planning. So maybe they think maybe the planning with the planning in place on this it's worth 750. If they paid 744, then actually they only have to give them two grand <laughs> or three grand, right? So they could have already have built that into that purchase price because one of the ways of of deleting out this overage is that actually upon that trigger, they have to send in the value and the value has to say, okay, the property is now worth X. And then the X is then worked back from I on mean, that. I mean, the only other option is if actually they're not going to go for permitted development at the moment and they've already got a tenant lined up who is willing, who has, I don't know, given them a, 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 a signed a prospective lease or a letter of intent saying, yeah. actually, we're going to rent it at a very large sum for this period of five years yeah, we'll five and, years and, 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 and take it. And then after five years, yeah, we'll crack on and, and get the plan. Yeah. Well, I think, I think it wouldn't be too difficult or too impossible to rent it at like 35, 40,000 per annum I as a whole building. I think you've got a point. And the five year time limit is an interesting angle. I, I honestly feel that someone has bought this without looking at the overage clause. I think a great buyer for this would have been someone to say, well, I'm an owner-occupier business. I'll just go in there, do a business for five years, well, stick in my vape shop or whatever. Let's stick it in our sass and whack it in there because we've got nothing else to spend exactly. it on at the moment. And then five and years' time, you, you're good to go with the yeah, conversion yeah, yeah. and get I the mean, uplift. The, the other thing, kind of just forgetting about the, the overage for a moment um, and looking at the price that they've paid, is the cost of doing this refer like doing this conversion it's an epce at the moment yeah and as we know like 2025 everything's got to be a c or above if it's residential and if they are going for residential going from a an e to a d can sometimes be fairly simple get some led lights in and get double glazing on and that sort of thing Going from a D to an E can sometimes be quite expensive. So I'd, I'd, I'd just be wondering if they have factored that in as well for the build cost to, to, to what they're going to have to do in order to get that sort of usable by 2025. But yeah, in, interesting one. I, I can't help but think, uh, like, like you, Ranjan, they've maybe, uh, they've maybe jumped the gun on the price a little bit here, but maybe they know something we don't, and maybe they've got... Uh, I don't know, an occupier ready to ready to, spe to to lease it for an awful lot of money, in which case it's worth it for them. So what do you think? Do you think they've overpaid? Yeah. Paid the right price? I, I, think, I, think they've, I think they've overpaid, but I think, I think overpaying with an overage like that in places can be quite tactical. Yeah. I, I think the auction did its job here and someone paid the market value for this property. Yeah. I, it wouldn't be a deal for us, yeah. but I don't think someone massively overpaid. Well, there's one clear winner, and that's, of course, the old bill. <laughs> <laughs> it's criminal when you think about it. <laughs> so, so for our next deal, we're off to Eltham High Street for a mixed shop and up as Piotr is all this one all about. We'll get back to the video in just a moment. What is the most exciting opportunity in property right now? And that is repurposing defunct commercial buildings to residential use. Now, most people don't really know where to start, what to look for and how to exploit these opportunities. And that's why I've prepared 90 minutes of free training for you to get you started on this wonderful journey. You can register for this free training at property-workshop.com. Join me on that free training and I'll leave you to enjoy the rest of the video. Well, this is uh, this is a building. Uh, it's uh, yeah. Well, what else is there? <laughs> it's an office, a former office with uh, some warehouse 
warehouse facilities. It's uh, in Eltham, sort of behind Eltham High Street, actually. Um, and it got access through an electronic gate on Westman Road. So you access it from here. It used to be owned by a commercial owner and they used to run their businesses from there. Um, currently it's vacant. It's, uh, it's uh, the, guy that's, the guy that's 165 to 175 uh, thousand pounds. And uh, I think it's got potential. What use class is it? Well, this is an office. Yeah, on the VOA and, and other On the VOA, way. it's an office. Okay, yeah, it but, it's but it doesn't, it's well. not marketed as an office, is it? Well, it's, it's a two-story office and warehouse. The warehouse facility concerns me. What, what, the, what part of that is? I think this is an office with additional warehouse facility at the, bo at the top. So ancillary it's warehouse. Ancillary yeah, warehouse, yeah. Yes. Compact. There is a video that we can have a look, uh, just have a quick look at. It's basically, this is the access gate. Mm -hmm. yeah. This is the building. It's in a mm -hmm. bad condition. What do you say the guide was? 165 to 170. So let's have a look. I mean, at the time of filming, this auction's going on right now. So we can click on that thing and see what the live bidding is. 162 currently, and the reserve is met. So the reserve is below the guide price. Oh, wow. So, so that means it, it will be sold at 162 if someone, if no one bids. How long has the bidding got left? Uh, there's three, two and a half hours left. We, we better edit this quickly and get it out there. <laughs> um, okay, so what size is it? What's the footprint? Okay, so now here are interesting things. Guys, uh, we did some digging into this building. And uh, to, to extend the footprint? No. <laughs> we did some digging and uh, there's some EPCs uh, available. Uh, on the EPC, it's about 120, 130 square meters. Yeah. Uh, but we actually got, uh, we got, we got plans for this building from uh, our sources. Those are uh, historical plans. However, uh, we know that this building is about 150 square meters. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, like, um, yeah, the, the, that's the size of it. And that's about 75 square meters for downstairs, about 75 for upstairs, uh, which makes it fairly decent. Um, there is a couple of issues with this building, uh, which I think a lot of people might be concerned about. Because the title for this building is uh, kind of separated. It used to be part of a much bigger title. Uh, however, this title is now on, on its own and there is no access rights within the title, uh, which is a little bit concerning. How long was the previous occupier there? And is this or the seller? The there? current seller has owned it since 2009. Okay. So could there be some, uh, some rights or arranged uh, through, through, through the seller to be assigned to the buyer? I'd say definitely. So the, in the legal part, they provided a, 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 an indemnity insurance, yeah, yeah. Uh, which obviously might be good, might not be good. Mm -hmm. You never know what, the, what it's going to be like with insurance. Uh, however, what uh, gave, gave us a little bit more confidence with this building is that it says in the particulars that the property is located in a well-connected area of South London with access via secure electronically operated double gate of Westman Road. And for that to be in the particulars, and uh, the seller had to approve those particulars. So if... Uh, so you can go back and sue the seller for giving you... Uh, exactly. Yeah, well, on the, the wrong... The, the easiest way to fix this, if, if, if you've got the right kind of solicitor and you, you know how to kind of ingratiate, when you're dealing with a seller, if you pay your deposit on time, you give all, you know, they can see that you are a bona fide good purchaser. Mm -hmm. You can approach them and say, look, there's going to be a cost to what we're about to suggest, but we'll pay for it. Here, can you do a statutory declaration? We'll cover the, your solicitor's cost in preparing that. And can you just confirm that for the past 12 years, yes. you have had unfettered access to and from that building via that electronic gate? And that is something that you can then register on title or get a, an extra easement built into that title, which completely liquefies any problem and any fear of you thinking, I'm about to buy a landlocked plot of land because yeah. that's what that ti that's what that title plan says there it says because normally on a title plan it have like a blue yeah. outline Coming thing out going to the, you, you to the high street to the high or... street that's not there on this one so for anyone who who would be looking for that 
that would put them off. But then, of course, as we've seen with the last property, we could, it could equally be that someone doesn't know that that yeah. would be the case and yeah. would just bid willy-nilly. And so would the plan then be for permitted development to residential on this? And yeah. I'm guessing there's no Article 4 in the area? No. And no. There's, there's no Article 4. It is in, in this is Lewis. Greenwich. This is Greenwich, yeah. um, which isn't the most friendly council for uh, like converting commercial properties. No, which yeah. ones are? I mean, yeah. uh, uh, well, flood mean, risk, all of that, is that okay? Uh, I mean, it's next yeah, to a reservoir and all of that. And parking and things like that, well, transport, P-TAL, so, if you need so, it. So, so. That, that would be, um, so the plan would be possibly to put parking in here, like as part of and this building, the under yeah. cloth parking, and then make this into one bedroom flat and this into a two bedroom flat. And so ground, ground floor would be a one bed flat with undercroft parking and then a two bed flat yeah. on the first floor. I mean, the only issue is this access thing because although you may have had unfettered pedestrian access, vehicle access is a different yeah. ball game. And what's, and what's, what's the public transport like in terms of a P-TAL? Because it's well, in London and it's a expected. fairly short walk to the, to the station. station. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah, is, yeah, yeah, it is. Yeah, it's pretty close. Yeah, so stations. And you're on the high street, which has regular um, buses. Yeah, yeah. So I'd, I'd assume it's a decent enough P-TAL to, to argue the case that it doesn't need parking if you had to go down yeah. that level. Yeah. What about, it's obviously in what was once a, I don't know, business park, industrial park type setting, what is around it? Because the other thing with PD will be things like um, noise and wanting to have a, a good quality of living that well, they can to, sometimes To the, to the frontage, on. you have, obviously it's a high street, you have ground floor commercial, mm -hmm. but the, the, the access drive directly in front of that building is parking for the residential elements above. Okay. That's basically the front of the, of the building. I wonder whether the owner of the, that's the front of the building yes. and this one's behind. Yeah, yeah. so a block of flats at the front of the building and uh, yeah, okay. I wonder whether the owner will just pick that up. Freeholder. Well, possibly, that's probably, well, I think we can see that as free bidders currently fighting for this. Um, uh, so it might be. So this is the current bidding for this. As I said, we're at the time of filming, this is a live auction. This one's actually being sold. So there are four bidders, it seems. No, three. So there's three. four bidders, yes. Four. This, is, this, this is actually our bid. Uh, and there's like, uh, three other bidders. And uh, obviously I've been following this bidding. And uh, at the time when this person submitted the bid, it, uh, it was already showing as reserve met, which basically means that this is a genuine uh, bid. Yeah, because otherwise the auctioneer could be kind of bringing, the, bringing it up because they don't want people to just well, start I mean, at the lowest point. It's suspicious almost. I think the, the original bid was 145, then it went two grand, which is a standard incremental jump, right? But then to go 13,000 pounds from 147 to 160, someone has literally come in and probably said to themselves, that's my bid. Yeah. So uh, they've, and, and some, this is one of the things that you look for when you're looking at bidding. Um, a lot of people say, don't be the first to bid. Well, it's ridiculous. You kind of want to see the price point and the price level to know where you stand in, in, in that ordering. But that, that person there who bid the 160, knew, once they saw that, they saw the reserve was met. Two additional bidders have gone up a thousand pounds a pop each. Um, they haven't come back in yet, although really, the majority of the action on these lots happens within the first, last 10 minutes. Yeah, yeah last yeah. 10 minutes. Now, last this is what I'm fascinated by, because you guys have opened up batting here. I opened up. Very, very early on. I'll tell, I'll tell, I'll give you tell the reason. Tell me why. I'll yes. give you the reason. And, and that reason is, uh, I never used the system. And clearly, I think it's a really bad system. Yeah. And because of that, I don't want to leave myself to kind of put my last bid in the last 10 minutes, because what if it doesn't work? Like, so I was like, I registered myself, I went through this whole process, and it actually was fairly easy to register, uh, that I have to give it to them. But in general, I don't, like, I don't know this system, I don't like this system. So I thought, let me register, let me put my first bid, just so that it opens up. And equally, it could have been the auction, yes, opening it up the bidding it doesn't matter one for five it doesn't matter. it was a safe bid because it was 25,000 it was sorry it was 20,000 pounds less yeah, than the minimum um, yeah. guide price yeah so I, I I've been I'm very tempted to like put the bid in like uh, earlier on what I've seen quite recently is some of these auctions doing the guide and we know the reserve has to be within 10 percent of the guide but there's been certain auctions that will remain nameless here 
that have actually not been keeping to that and suddenly yeah. it's not then sold yeah. even though it's been within 10% of the advertised guide yeah. and yeah. you're asking why and they, and they, and they keep very quiet I about think, it. I, so. think, I think in here we can highlight there's like three types of auction, yes. Uh, there is uh, this type of auction, yeah. They clearly hasn't, they haven't dropped the guide price when they dropped the reserve price because yeah. they probably said the reserve price initially be around 175 with the seller. They have dropped the, the reserve price clear to about 160 and they haven't reduced the, the guide price, which I think is pretty bad because that can then attract a lot of people into bidding if you reduce the guide price. So that's one type of auction yet. They just like do nothing. They just set things once and then forget it. Then there is uh, auctioneers, for example, like also Acutus. They never set the reserve price right now lower than the guide price mm -hmm. or higher than the guide price. So if the guide price is 165, the reserve would be 165. They drop the reserve, they drop the guide price. If they increase the reserve, they increase the guide price. And then there's some nameless auctioneers uh, who basically put the guide price in 165 and then the reserve, let's see, 250 or whatever the seller asked them to do, and uh, which isn't good for the industry. It isn't good for the trust in the, in the auction it, it process. Removes, it removes the transparency, right? Because most people who are going to auction think, right, okay, there's a property here, it's 250,000 pounds. I'm willing to pay 290. Yeah. That person has confidence knowing, even if someone paid 300, I'm in the running past yeah. 275. Yeah. So then they know they're not wasting their time. They can get the solicitor to do the review of the legal, legal pack. They know they're in a position. I don't instantly dislike this process because what will happen is, what I guess what they were hoping for is that someone would start the bidding at, at 165. Mm. In which case their vendor, knowing that their reserve is 160, is five grand up. Or maybe someone would have said 170, midway between the 165 and the 175. So I don't instantly dislike it. It's a little bit of a mind game. Mm -hmm. It can look lazy to a trained eye, but I, I don't instantly dislike it. But there are a couple of auctioneers that operate these range guides and then sometimes stick the reserve just below those range guides, yeah. knowing that someone's going to think, well, I may as well start at the minimum guide, right? Um, so again, not completely dis distasteful for me, but... Um, it obviously didn't work in this instance. But listen, are, are you going to increase your bid live on this show? I, I'm, I'm going to wait. You're going to wait. wait. You're going to wait. You're going to, wait. You're going to keep wait. us waiting. I, I've, like, I've, got, I've got JP Python in this oh, one. We, we, we set the strategy and we cannot yeah. like... Uh, we kind of, yeah, we have to take that person's... Um, uh, so I... I what, do you, what do you think it will be worth? What do you think the GDV will be... So of, of, think, of this, if you did what you I said. Think of we work out the access issue, which should be fine. If we get the PD for two flats, I think a two bedroom flat on the first floor, 350, one bedroom flat, 250, 600 for a GDV, mm -hmm. 100 to do it. So that's 500, about 100K profit. So that's 400. So I think the site with planning is going to go off around 400. More or less. Great deal, and uh, we'll be putting our bid in in the last <laughs> five minutes of the they sale, but don't tell them that. They've already declined your card. Locking Pia in the toilet, <laughs> are we? <laughs> yes. The Wi Fi is off. What's happening? <laughs> but I, I tell you what, the, 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 the two recent bidders, the way that they have started bidding is I would be inclined to follow that £1,000 incremental. Because normally, sometimes I would say just go in 20 grand above where they are and fight, frighten them off. But actually, I think we're probably close to where people want to be on it. Because I, th I think, I, I think, I think, I think, I think their bidding is really timid. Yes. Like, it's like people are concerned that they clearly have got some concerns. Um, but we never know. We never I've know. seen bidding where there's literally just two people interested in the property, no bids until five minutes yes. till the end, yes. and then it goes crazy. It goes crazy. Because on something like this, if we if we say actually our next bid, let's go one seven five, let's try and scare them off, you could get that J S or A turn around and go, well, I'm not going to let them do that, and all of a sudden you incite yeah. a competition, which as 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 a buyer you kind of if we went now from one six two to one six five. We wouldn't do it at this time because we want it to run down a little bit. But even if we went up that three grand, their response is going to tell us. If they went up by another thousand, we know that they're, they're not going to aggress. My strategy in the room would be to shout my bid, but unfortunately... Ser yes. Serious yeah. fi financial psychology here, <laughs> isn't it? Oh. Yeah.
But no, in the room, that's exactly what we yeah. would do. We would we much would easier to operate in a room than it is online. Throw a hand I, in the air, shout one seven five. Because you can see everyone around, especially with someone of your posture. Yeah, when I stand <laughs> next to them and pull their hand down like this. <laughs> there is a trend emerging here, though. I mean, here and for the viewers at home. I mean, this is uh, th there's something to be had from fixing a problem. Mm. If you can identify a problem with a lot that might put off a lot of lazy buyers, should we say, mm -hmm. and you've got the knowledge and the team to sort it out, uh, then there, it's going to attract less bidders, which means you're more likely to go away with a bargain. That's yeah. it. Yeah. Unless, of course, we lock you in the toilet yeah. and make it. <laughs> Say the password. <laughs> <laughs> Right, okay, that's it for this episode of Auction Watch. Hope you've enjoyed it. Make sure you smash that like button. Let us know what you think about what we've discussed in the comments below and smash that subscribe and bell icon. Thanks very much, uh, Piot, Rod and Jay. See you guys in the next episode. High streets across the land are changing forever. Basically, there's an oversupply of retail premises. Shops are closing down, more are gonna close down in the future. The government know this, and that's why they've introduced, or they're introducing a light touch planning system, which allows small developers to easily repurpose these buildings to residential use under a light touch planning regime called permitted development. Now, this is going to be the biggest revolution uh, and the biggest change and the biggest opportunity for property investors um, that I've ever seen. And this is all coming into effect on 1st of August. So you need to know what's happening and what properties to look for to take advantage of these opportunities so that you can get in there and take that first mover advantage. I've got a 90 minute free masterclass to get you ready for August the 1st. Make sure you join me, click the link below. Whether you're a beginner or expert, we'll get you started.